Hello YouTube, greetings from the Lazy Eyebrow to a video about a project I have finally finished. This is the HO scale alt mode for an accurate astrotrain. In the first video I made about this project, I chronicled how I modeled the shell for printing, how I used a locomotive that was way too big and the wrong configuration, and how the prints failed in every which way possible. And then I finished off finding out the locomotive the astrotrain was based on didn't even run on standard gauge rails, unless you count that one time the Japanese built an upscaled version for the Korean railway. Well, given that version does exist, and astrotrain size changes all the time to accommodate modes anyway, we are surging forward. So for my second attempt at this project, I purchased a Canadian National 282 Mikado locomotive on eBay. This ended up being mostly perfect. The benefits of this model is the Mikado configuration is exactly what astrotrain was, as the D50, 51, 52s were all built with this wheel configuration. So, the size of the wheels was right, the configuration of lead, drive, and trailing wheels were accurate, the main rod connects to the third axle, unlike my 484 locomotive, which connected to the second, so with all this accuracy, what could be wrong? Well, this locomotive is reliant on the tender for its power. It has all its electrical in the locomotive pick up its power from one rail through the axis of the driving wheels, and the other rail through this roundabout way of the axis on the tender, which are then routed to the copper plate, connected by a screw, which sends the power along the drawbar to this pin, to a wire, that delivers it to the other terminal of the motor. I don't know why exactly it was decided that this was the best way to get power, but that's neither here nor there. For a proper astrotrain, we need to be independent of the tender. So that was my first hurdle of this project, learning how to wire up consistent pickups from the isolated drive wheels. After watching a few tutorials, I started with nickel silver beading wire. I shaped it so that it conformed to the chassis, then poked out and made contact with the inner surface of the wheels, and then I applied it to all four wheels. This worked for a whole three minutes. Unfortunately, beading wire is such that the moment I tried this on a curve, the axles would push the wire and it would lose connection to the wheels. After a few more attempts, I finally made a shape that would always be in contact with the wheels. However, this also made so much friction that it jammed the gear assembly, and next thing I knew, there was smoke pouring out of the motor, and apparently I was beginning to melt the electromagnet that drives the motor. So let's table this pickup problem and move on to fixing a new one. This is the electromagnet. On this locomotive, mainly due to its age, it's huge. Well, the enamel wire that made it all work, with the smoke coming off it and its age, I figured it would probably be in my best interest to replace it. So I bought a spool of enamel coated wire, printed myself a holder with a three wing attachment, and then began winding a new electromagnet. So now that wiring is red, and slightly thicker wire than what came off of it, so that's neat. Back to the pickups. Around this time, I also noticed that because this side of the locomotive wasn't having anything to do with power, the manufacturer also added rubber grips to the first and fourth wheel. Assuming this was just put into a normal wheel, I just cut the thing off and carry on my business. What I didn't see though, evidently there's a groove in this wheel for that grip to sit in. So when I finally got the pickup attempt going again, it was creating a bunch of sparks as it introduced a very, very small gap between the wheel and the rail. Enough for the power to jump from the wheel to the rail, like a spark plug, causing burn marks all over the track and that wheel. So seeing these problems, I tore apart the whole thing, swapped the third and first axles, and continued working from there. At this point, knowing this beading wire wasn't working, and I could only get power from two axles instead of the originally planned four, I turned back to the original locomotive I used at first. It's a bit newer, in fact it's only about 15 years old, and is tender independent. Turns out it was using copper filaments, shaped to the curve of the wheels, with one per wheel. Since I only need two, I nipped off the last one on each side of the four, and took it to the Mikado. The great thing about these filaments is that they're flexible enough to move about, but if they're bent, they'll hold that shape, which is perfect for when the wheels move about in a curve. So with those installed in the first two axles and power from the other rail being drawn from everywhere else, now we can move on to the shell. So given this is a smaller, more accurate wheel set I'm using, the model needed tweaks to fit better to the chassis, which also meant making some super thin boiler walls, as the motor from this 1980-something locomotive was not playing around in size. This also meant a few test prints to get the sizing right, and to make sure everything was square. On another note, I haven't quite figured out how to make proper fitment tests in resin yet, at least down to like the 0.1 of a millimeter, but I have on the FDM, so all the holes for screws are printed on the Ender 3. These needed molded in as well, as well as attachment points that all hold it securely between the FDM to the resin parts. The model then needed broken up into those parts, and over the course of a week I began printing all of them to assemble the locomotive shell, and the next thing I knew, I had a shell, ready to go. On then to painting the base coat, 
adding details, printing off water slides, adding vinyl, clear coating, installing and testing LED lights, and finally, assembling. 11 months after starting this project and working on it on and off in my free time, I present you with a fully functional HO scale Astro Train with the Astro Tender. This has been such a fun project. So many new skills learned just to get to this point, and I am super happy with the result. So let's go over some of those details. The prevailing color scheme is a rich purple with a charcoal gray accents. Most of the places where there's molded detail, I've added the charcoal gray. Stuff like pipes and brackets or the handles of the smoke box or handrail. You get the idea. The number plate is a water slide. From what I could find, the JNRD class locomotives always had their number plate start with a class of locomotive, so in this case, D51, and then the three digits for the specific locomotive. I picked 048 as a reference to the release number of the original G1 Astro Train in Japan. On the sides, you see more of where I painted the charcoal and the pipes, floorboards, and such. Anywhere where I thought it would nicely complement without overpowering the color palette, and on this thick band of the molding, I referenced the G1 toy by painting it black and adding a red vinyl stripe. It sort of sticks out, but I feel it does so in a good way, just like the tasteful bit of color amongst the predominantly purple vehicle. Near the back, I painted the cylinders charcoal, the whistles and safety valve were treated to brass, the inside of the window spaces I went with a metallic gold, the shading of the small spaces make it seem darker than the paint really is, which is fine seeing as how it makes me feel like there's a fiery glow inside. And then the window trim picked out in charcoal again. Initially, I had done the same metallic gold to the cab's side window, but the paint kept getting messy and it was hard to get a clean line, so I painted the whole thing charcoal and turned to water slides. And I'm kind of glad I did, as having it just plain color would be kind of boring compared to what I ended up doing. In each of the cab windows are rumble and frenzy, one of which having an engineer's cap and blowing the whistle. You can decide which one of those is which, I'm not touching that with a five foot pole. And the number plate can be seen below that. Finally, we come to the tender. Before painting this, I added one of the 3D labels from Toy Hacks and super glued it in place to give it that raised logo look. Then base coated the whole thing in the purple. After that, I detailed the rest in the charcoal, like the ladders, the chassis itself, the top water tank doors, the various caps, even the red for the tail lamps. And for what you can't see, because it's always attached to the locomotives, more charcoal in the various doors in the front. As for what you can't see in the locomotive, printed thruster bells painted black of the cab section. I designed 5mm compatibility into them so that I can add the blast effects that came with the likes of Omega Supreme or Skylinks or whatever I have on hand. Due to the way these stick out, I had to design a new drawbar for the tender to accommodate the length, but now it all works together as one cohesive unit. As for the lights, they don't quite work like they did in testing, and I'm not super well versed in electrical engineering, so what I need to change is something I'll have to learn one day, but with that being said, provided the ambient lights are low, they shine well enough to see. The headlight is sort of dim, but the thrusters light up quite nicely. As an Astro Train locomotive by itself, it really does well what I set out for it to do. It looks the part. It's also quite heavy, weighing in at 14 ounces, making it one of the heaviest locomotives I own, and the extra rubber grips also make it one of the strongest engines in my collection, which makes it a really good thing I made the accompanying tender into a custom as well, because the tender retains its horn hook coupler, which means you can absolutely pull freight trains with the boosters aren't on. I kind of like that. Like Optimus can pull the trailer out of a subspace pocket. Why can't Astro Train pull the tender out of thin air? He can be mobile and fly around in a shuttle and land on rails and all that nonsense as a standalone unit, but then pull his tender from subspace and haul 400,000 tons of energy on across the Tehachapi Pass. That being said, why do we never see Astro Train doing what trains do best? Why does Long Haul get that rat for lugging stuff around when that's literally all trains do all day? Well, now we do see it. Here's Astro Train lugging freight around with the Stunticons and the Autobots waiting at a level crossing. It's nice to see the journey this thing has been on. Starting from the locomotive that was too big with all of its failed prints, to the small locomotive with all of its tests and failed prints, to the finished product, a working model of Astro Train. And man, like, look at that size difference. This is what I was originally shooting for. In hindsight, this looks way too disproportionate. I am very much glad the project was abandoned and moved to the proper locomotive. As for size comparisons, here's an HO scale AC4400 and 00 scale Bachman James. Honestly, I'm not bothered by putting Astro Train next to the 00 stuff, considering the D51 is smaller than standard gauge stuff anyway. Consider it the upscaled Korean variant that Hero was. Like all things considered, for a true HO scale D51, we'd be looking at the G1 Astro Train here. So honestly, I'm fine considering Astro Train HO or 00, depending on how you want to look at things. As for more topical comparisons, here's the Siege Astro Train. And it's funny, I never considered this to be HO scale probably because of the weird proportions, but it's really, really weird in my case that I never checked because it's something I totally would've. But yeah, 
here he is, both without and with the tender, about the same size if you ignore the weird wide body of the Earthrise one. And for properly scaled stuff, here's G1 Astro Train, Earthrise Starscream, who I covered happens to be HO scale in its review, HO scale Stunticons, and for one more, here's Skylinks, in his way underscaled shuttle mode. People keep asking if I'm planning on making a scaled shuttle mode, and uh, no. Like even Skylinks is a big shuttle, and that's underscaled. For fun, I put a 3D shuttle in Blender and scaled the two accordingly, and a scaled shuttle that would be proper compared to Astro Train would look like this. Yeah, I don't have room to put something this big, but hey, now you know what scale comparison would be and why the miniature train that converts to massive shuttle is just as silly as the plane that turns into its own aquatic mobile landing strip. So yeah, this was the project I've been working on. A not necessarily scale accurate astro train to fit within my HO scale alt modes collection. It can haul cargo wherever Megatron needs it, or race high speed electric passenger trains. Astro train is a rather a versatile locomotive. That being said, is it perfect? No. One day I'd like to make a third attempt on this project, preferably one that the locomotive is designed to run separate from the tender, as all the modifications I've made leaves the model not really enjoying the high speeds. The connections I've installed don't exactly connect the best way they possibly could, and the high speed creates conditions for micro-arcing, and that means lots of cleaning after a high speed run. Also, the LED lights seem to flicker, the lights themselves not being as bright as I would have hoped, so the third attempt I'd like to install some sort of capacitor to smooth out the current and reconfigure the wiring to make them a bit brighter too. Project for another time though. Beyond the improvements I'd like to make for the next time, I'm still quite happy with how this thing turned out. It's been such a labor of love and I've really enjoyed sharing all the process of getting to this point and now I have a working HO Astro train. Hope you've all enjoyed watching. Next up, the Unicron Review. This has been the Lazy Eyebrow.